What's going on, Washington Commanders Nation? It's your boy, Rio Robinson. We didn't get the Victory Tuesday pod with me and Lake that we usually got because we were battling some technical difficulties and some things via YouTube, but we're doing it on Wednesday, and I'm kind of glad we didn't do it yesterday now because Washington had some breaking news at the deadline yesterday. How are we doing this morning, Lake? I'm good, my friend. How are you? I'm doing excellent, man. I, we've been saying all year that this team is good enough that, you know, if they were to add a couple pieces or add a very specific piece at its biggest need at the deadline, boy, anything could happen in 2024. But breaking news from the park yesterday, Washington acquires Marshawn Lattimore, cornerback one from the New Orleans Saints for a third round pick a fourth round pick and a sixth round pick. So basically we gave them the Ridgeway pick back. We added one of our thirds and not the one we got from Philadelphia and a fourth round pick for the number one corner that we do not have on the roster right now. What was your initial reaction? <laughs> I mean, I thought it was great. I mean, this was something that needed to be done. And if you're the commanders, you know, and you're the brain trust for them and Adam, uh, Adam Peters and Dan Quinn, you're basically telling the players that, look, we think you guys are good enough to, to go on a run. You know, we think you guys are good enough to compete with the Philadelphias and Detroits and Minnesotas and Green Bays of San Francisco, whoever you want to throw at them. We feel like you guys can compete. Well, now by going out and making this kind of move, it's saying to these guys, we think you can beat these guys. Now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's exactly what this move was. And this was a smart move, too, not just for this year, Rio. But Marshawn Lattimore is 28 years old. You know, he's still relatively young. I mean, yeah, he's been in the league now for, what, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. But he's still relatively young. You know, you still can get corners to play into their early 30s. So, you know, you're this is probably more like a four- to five-year deal for them. And it shores up a position of weakness that now they have a true shutdown number one corner. Absolutely. And age 28 season and – the New Orleans Saints already negotiated some contract adjustments for him earlier this year. So he's only making 600000 for the duration of this season, $18 million next year, $18.5 million the year after that. So $37 million over three years to get him through his age 30 season. That is a no-brainer move for the Washington Commanders, and it and now allows a guy like Benjamin St. Juice to be a natural number number two cornerback it allows Mikey Sandra still to return to his natural habitat in the slot and guys like Igbenogany and Forbes can just be out there in a reserve role until yeah, he gets bro. healthy I think this was a no-brainer move for Washington I love it man yeah it was and you know if you look at his style you know his style of play he's he's that physical aggressive mm -hmm. uh number one true corner that if you look at Dan Quinn's history, you know, he's had this in all of his defenses, you know, going yeah. back to Seattle. Um, and then you look at the past few years in Dallas, you know, Diggs was was that guy, you know, obviously he got injured, you know, two years ago and he's coming, kind of, he's back now. But, you know, if you look at the way they play defense as far as fast and free, they, they really haven't been able to sustain, you know, coverage, you know, for long periods of time. And now, you know, with them playing Philadelphia twice coming up, the Cowboys twice, you think about it. Uh, you know, who, who was going to cover C.D. Lamb? Who was going to cover A.J. Brown? Maybe even Devonta Smith, you know, and really feel comfortable about that. We've seen how these corners have been cooked in the past by these guys. So now, if you can move St. Juice, as you said, Rio, back to a, a number two corner, I think he excels in that role. He doesn't have to cover the team's best receiver, and now he can play his game. And then Mikey Sandra still, yeah, I mean, he's been playing well on the outside, and I know he's he prefers that, but the team drafted him to be in the slot, and that's yeah. where he's going to go to now. So for me, man, this was just a, a, a home run hit big time because now you got a guy that's nasty on the field, talks a lot, he, he fits in with the culture and the style of play that they want to play on defense uh, that Joe would just get to the ball with bad intentions type defense. 
Mm-hmm. He definitely depicts that dog ass mentality that Dan Quit and Joe Witt Jr. He's very violent to be a cornerback. He will come up and hit you in the screen game. He will come down and throw his pads at you in the run game. And we know what he could do in coverage. I feel a lot more comfortable with Marshawn Lattimore running the fade with AJ Brown, with CD Lamb, than making Benjamin St. Juice, Igbenogany, or Forbes do that because. That's not, those are not good matchups for them. Like our biggest issue with our corners, like we don't have a guy that can run that also has size to go with some of these guys. Marshawn Lattimore is the perfect blend of both. Yeah. And, you know, also guys that have playmaking and ball tracking ability. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Mikey Samristow is probably the best out of all the corners that they have that can do that. And he's a rookie. So that tells you something. So to get a guy, Marshawn Lattimore, that that can pick the ball off, that can jump routes, that can do all of the above, really good tackler on top of that. That's probably the most underrated part of his game is that he will come up and hit you. You know, these are all facets that they needed on the back end of their defense on the, on the outside, especially. And, and you know, I I, I want to bring this up, Rio. Um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, and I told Bobby I wouldn't say anything. You know, I wasn't going to write about it or anything. But he and I were having a conversation in the locker room. And it was just him, myself, and I asked him, I said, look, you've been on a Super Bowl team that won one. You've been on a team that lost one. You're, you're going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer when you hang it up. Um, you recognize really good football teams. Do you feel like this football team can be a contender? And his exact words to me were, it can be. He said, however, when I was in Seattle the year we won the Super Bowl, we made a big move during the uh, middle of the season to bring in some defensive help. He said, and that kind of shored things up for us. He said, and then from that point on, it was it was go get the Super Bowl. L- look, um, that's exactly <laughs> what just happened yesterday. <laughs> yep. Literally to a T, that's exactly what just mm-hmm. happened. That move was to signal to these guys that, yes, we think you can go on a run here and um, – how fitting would it be? I know I'm thinking ahead here quite a bit, but how fitting would it be for Washington to go into Detroit with the way things happen with the, the coaching search mm-hmm. and, and put it into that dream season? <laughs> oh my God, it would be it would be poetic justice. And just to even think about that and Washington being this legit in year one, Adam Peters has come come in and clearly put in an executive of the year debut as the general manager here in DC Lance Newmark as the assistant GM as well. They've come in here. They've hit on multiple picks. It seems like they've struck gold with seven to eight free agent signings. And they've now added a number one at the biggest position of knee. We may have got our franchise quarterback left tackle and our cornerback one in one off season, not to mention the team is seven and two for the first time since the nineties late. They went up to New York on Sunday. It was not the prettiest of victories, but they come back home with the dub. And like Jaden Daniels said, divisional games on the road. You're just happy to come out of there with a victory. Yeah, they they went up there. It was a business trip. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think that they did. I think they saw and I I know this sounds crazy, Rio, but they saw how bad the Giants were. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I don't think you saw guys put their foot on the gas pedal probably the way they should have. The Giants should have been out of there by by halftime. You know, 21-7. The game should have been a blowout. Washington had the ball coming out of halftime. And we were expecting everything to just get ugly up in MetLife, and it didn't. So, But they never, in my opinion, were in threat uh, or any serious threat of of losing that football game. They controlled the game. But just defensively, I would have liked to have seen them play a little bit better um, because the offense does what it needs to do. They're going to get you points, whether it's three, whether it's seven. Mm -hmm. Um, Their efficiency rate is, what, 48.9%. They're getting into on every drive. That's just unheard of. So, you know, every two times they get the football, they're going to get your points. You just need your defense now to shore some things up, and they did with that move of uh, Marshawn Lattimore. Lattimore. So, yeah, the Giants are a bad football team, and guess what? Good football teams do. They beat bad football teams. And I think it's safe to say that if there's a bad football team left on the schedule this year, which there are, there's several of them, Washington's beating them. (laughs) And that's just a good sign. Absolutely. And 
while our run defense left a lot to be desired and late in the game we were letting daniel jones get his shit off more than i would have liked him to whatever reason he always turns it up on us at some point of the game washington never felt like they were going to lose this football game to the giants from the get-go we were in control and our offense we didn't do what our offense typically does and we still gave them 27 points and that's thanks in part from the rookie quarterback who was playing like an MVP, 15 for 22, over 200 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, and we left meat on the bone. Jaden Daniels makes this stuff look very easy. He gets his first divisional sweep of his career, and it only took two catches for Terry, but both of them hit pay dirt. He has one touchdown shy of his career high. Boy, how fast things change when you get a real quarterback in this building. It does, man. You know, and every week we keep talking about how Terry's ascending and ascending and ascending. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just he's he's making the big catches. You know, he's always made big catches, but they weren't for touchdowns. And now he's scoring. You know, if you tell me he's going to get two catches in the game, you might be like, well, is that a number one? But those two catches are touchdowns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you want. It's, it's called production. And I think Terry's game has risen because he has a guy that's making him look better. He has a quarterback. I mean, that, that back end zone uh, fade that he threw to him, it, I mean, my God, the was ball beautiful. was in Terry's <laughs> chest. I mean, he had no choice but to catch it, you know? Mm -hmm. Those are the type of throws that Terry wasn't getting for years in the past. You know, we saw Terry making a lot of 50-50 balls, dives, and things of that nature. And he's done that this year, too but he's also had the easier catches where he can catch and get some yak afterwards, you know? So everything is just much easier when you have an elite talent at that quarterback position. And I think this is the thing now, I think fans are starting to catch up to us, Rio, as far as understanding why we kept saying, this isn't a mirage. This nope. isn't a joke or a fluke. This is real because you have the most important position on the field covered and for my money, the second most important position on the field and on an offense is now covered, too, because that's Brandon Coleman. Mm -hmm. Only time I heard Brian Burns name called was he potentially had a pass rush on Jaden and Jaden got away from him to the sideline. Mm -hmm. But other than that, Brandon Coleman literally <laughs> put a wall up. And, and this we've seen this all year when he's played. You know, he's just he's just shutting guys out that are premier edge rushers. And if you think about it, you have a rookie left tackle, you have a rookie quarterback, and now, you know, you have that veteran Pro Bowl receiver, and now you're going on the other side of the field, you got that corner position locked up um, that we had talked about. It, it, it's scary to think that this has all been done, as you said, in one year, and not even a full season. It's, it's halfway mark, and they have it all locked up now. And you think of the capital that they have, the the money, the the free uh, you know for free agents next year, as well mm -hmm. as the draft picks. It, it, this is just something, man. That I don't think anyone could have written a better script. If they ever gonna write a movie about how you put together a, a, an NFL team and run it and and do well in your first year, Washington has the actual uh, you know Emmy winning blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. when they told us recalibration and not rebuild we should have listened to them because That's they've they got did. right to it yeah they, yeah. they, they got they right it. to it man yep it's they knew that this was something that uh it's called confidence man let's just mm -hmm. call it like it is you know these coaches knew what they were trying to accomplish they had a plan not just not lip service they had an actual plan in place I see it every day of practice. They have a plan in place for their practices. There's just no wasted movement, no wasted energy. Everything is 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 intentional, and the players play intentional. Jaden Daniels is intentional every time he steps foot on the field, and that's why you don't see the turnovers. That's why you don't see the false starts. That's why you don't see just the dumb penalties that we used to see over the years. Mm -hmm. um, any momentum, they would get something bad would happen and it would cost them and they weren't good enough to recover. Well, now this team's a good football team and good football teams don't shoot themselves in the foot. That's right. It's just something crazy to see, man. There's just a readiness and a preparedness about this team. Like I go back to like a small detail, you know, because the details matter. Austin Eckler said, I think it was around week two of the season, when he had a media scrum, he said, I've never been on a team that 
does this many walkthroughs. He says, we do a lot of walkthroughs. And what that does is it keeps everyone sharp of what the plan is for Sunday. For far too long, it doesn't matter what regime it was, Washington has got outcoached and outprepared by other teams, and they've come out not ready for opponents. We look ready for everyone every week. Even when we're not executing, it's something you can draw up to – something that you see in front of you. The team is ready to play every week, and they fight hard for their coaches. Yeah, you know, and those walkthroughs are mental things. Those are mental mm -hmm. laps, you know, where you just, as you said, you know, you're going to know what you're supposed to do at all times. And 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 they're doing it at a slow pace in those walkthroughs, so that way it stays in your mind. So, therefore, you're not out there and they're not looking like, the robots like they've looked over the past few years where they just didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. And that allows you to pay, play fast, free, physical. That's what they always preach to practice and say to us in the media. So it makes sense. And then the other thing is, is that I think it keeps guys fresh, you know, from, from injury, you know, when you're not always overdoing it in practice, you still can go out on Sundays and perform. And, and, and outside of the injury to Brian Robinson, I think for the most part this year, You've got to give, you know, Al Bellamy and Samantha Hawkins and nutritionists. You got to give all of those folks that that keep these guys fresh um, and injury free. You have to give them a lot of credit because yeah. this might be the the best year I've ever seen as far as this team not being besieged with injuries, especially to their core players. Uh, you know, the injury to Jaden, they handled that with first class care. And uh, he was back out on the field the next week, killing, no <laughs> you know, um, Brian Robinson. I know Brian wants to play and probably would have played if this was years past because they would have let him go out there hurt Pull him right back out there. Exactly. But but this this organization is like, you know what, you're too valuable to us for the long haul to risk it for today. Uh, so they're keeping him out when he wants to play. Make no mistake about that. And I, I like what I'm saying with that as well. Oh, yeah, man. But the job from the coaches, man, it cannot be understated. Bobby Johnson came in with a reputation that was very skewed by what he was coaching up in New York. He comes up and gets this offensive line playing on a top 10 clip in year one. The Giants were sacking quarterbacks and pressuring quarterbacks at a historic clip going yeah. into Sunday's game, and we shut them out on Sunday. No QB sacks. Brandon Coleman, our rookie left tackle out of TCU, gets his first full-time look at left tackle with Cornelius Lucas out, and he was lights out. He was lights out. We looked like we got one of them ones at left tackle, and that line as a unit – no, no Dexter Lawrence, no Brian Burns, no Aziz Ojolari. We shut that unit out. Cosme had Dexter Lawrence in shambles on Sunday. He did. And, and you know, you're right. You're talking about a vaunted defensive front. You know, the, the Giants defensive front have been the only thing that you could write about the Giants about this year that has done anything. And, you know, you're talking about three potential Pro Bowl players on that defensive front. They did nothing. I mean, it was eerily similar to the Cleveland game mm -hmm. uh, where Cleveland came in with Miles Garrett and uh, Zedarius uh, Smith. I mean, all these guys that you're expecting to get after Jaden put pressure on the rookie didn't happen. And, and the same thing didn't happen this past Sunday. And that's a testament to uh, Bobby Johnson and that defense. I mean, that offensive line. I mean, and, and what a fitting way. And they, they made sure they let him know about that on the sidelines after the game. They, uh, a lot of guys were going up to him, Cliff Kingsbury. Of course, they were shouting him out because they knew. He didn't say anything all week about it, you know, but they knew how important this was to him because the Giants basically let him go. They made him look like a scapegoat. And mm -hmm. for all I remember is in the offseason, I had a lot of Giants fans, you know, writing me, telling me, uh, you know, hey, look, um, you guys have a pretty good staff. It looks like you put together, but your offensive line coach is terrible. That's going to be a weak link for you. It's actually become a strength for Washington. Mm -hmm. Look at look at what a new environment could do for a guy, man. Now Bobby Johnson can go back to the reputation he had when he was a part of the Buffalo Bills coaching staff. Our offensive line completely shut out the Giants. We're talking Dexter Lawrence is a defensive player of the year candidate. He has nine sacks. He leads the league in sacks as a nose tackle. Sam Cosme took his lunch for the majority of the day. Aziz Ojolari and Brian Burns didn't even sniff the uniform 
form of Jaden Daniels on Sunday. And even when they got free release blitzes, Jaden is just too his instincts are too high, man. They get back there and he shakes them out their shoes. He picks up yards when he needs them. And he makes three to five plays or throws each week that make you say, wow, that guy is special. This game, it was that Noah Brown throw. That Noah Brown throw on the crosser right over two Giants defenders. He dazzles. He marvels every time he steps out on the field. Yeah, I mean, he's just he, – he's – you know, they say that once you get to the halfway mark of, of any professional sport, any season, you're a pro now and, and you, you've seen things, you know. So mm -hmm. clearly, you know, he, there's teams that he hasn't played against. You know, they're going to do throw different things. But for the most part, he's seen most of the base package defenses of the NFL. He's seen a lot of the exotic blitzing schemes and zone defenses, yep. you know, press coverage. He's seen it all at this point. And now – I think you're getting ready to see Jaden kick it into another gear. And that gear is he's listened to everyone say, get down slide um, where he still seems a little uncomfortable at times. Definitely a little he, awkward. Because <laughs> in his mind, he's thinking LSU Jaden, I'm turning this mm -hmm. up. I'm going to the house. Well, he understands that, you know, the, he's, he's a valuable asset here in DC. So mm -hmm. he rightfully is listening to the coaches and he's getting down. But I, I think now, the speed of the game, which was already a lot slower to him because he's so fast and so intelligent. He's, the game was slower to him more so than most rookie quarterbacks, okay? And I think the numbers don't lie. The historic clips don't lie. But I think now the game is going to really slow down, as you, you like to say, matrix style. You mm -hmm. know, it's going to really slow down, and you're going to start seeing him make plays that I don't think we've seen him make yet. And that's an even scarier thought for them, considering, you know, the Eagles and the Cowboys are coming up on their schedule. Um, Pittsburgh's a really good defense. Mike Tomlin has a lot of exotic looks on his defense. So to see Jaden yet again against another defense with another great front led by T.J. Watt, it's just going to be interesting to see how the game keeps slowing down to him as well. And it's crazy because I see a team with a, a great defense like Pittsburgh coming up on the schedule, and I'm not nervous because we got that <laughs> guy. His temperament, it's unflappable. He never gets happy feet in the pocket. He doesn't do a lot of rookie tendency things, man. He looks so calm, collected, and the guys believe in him, man. It looks easy. They didn't make a move at receiver before the deadline. I think in part to Noah Brown has become a very solid um, complimentary number two receiver. Five catches for 60 yards. That's 12 a pop on Sunday. Uh, two for 48 for Lamade Zacchaeus. How about that third down call on the last Washington possession where Washington doesn't want to give uh, I think it was a second down call, actually. They didn't want to give the Giants the ball back. Right before the two-minute warning, they're expecting us to run and eat clock right over their head top, wide open to Alameda Zacchaeus, man. Cliff be in his bag. Yeah, I mean, it's just – it's been a while, man, you know, since you've seen receivers open. You've seen guys mm -hmm. that just – aren't covered you know that's called scheming you know that's called finding the right spots on the field soft spots on the field and cliff does that with the best of them and, and and you know it's just it's just refreshing man you know to be able to see them pick up yards however they want to you know in the in years past and I, and I hate to keep harping on years past but we do have to have mm -hmm. you know this sample size this year compared to what we saw for years at a time and it was hard for them to get first downs. I mean, it was. it was always third and eight, third and seven. Like, they couldn't get yards. And now we're concerned if they're not getting seven. Yep. <laughs> That's a big difference, man. Mm -hmm. it's, a big, it's a big shift as a fan because – we went from, <clears throat> oh, my God, we have an anemic offense. We can only score 18 or 19 points a week to, wow, why didn't we score a touchdown? We want to score. The expectation with a rookie quarterback and new everything is to score every time we touch the football. 48% of our drives result in the red zone. 61% of our drives result in a score that is as efficient an offense as the NFL has seen since the year 2000 and the top half of this 
all, uh, the percentages of offense to do that usually make the Super Bowl. I'm not trying to go there yet, but Washington is producing on that historic and efficient a clip. The running game without Brian Robinson. We got 52 from Chris Rodriguez Jr. I wish he punched that last one in because I wanted the score yeah. to have a little cushion in between it. Yeah, yeah. He deserved it too, Rio. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was yeah. running hard. He was he was running hard, man. He was running like that sledgehammer that you know we saw in his rookie campaign, and and good for him because you know he's been moved up and back and up and back to the practice squad, but he's never mm -hmm. lost the confidence. Nope. And um, it goes to show you the depth that they have. Their depth is so deep and vast that they can pull guys off the practice squad and come in and get starters minutes mm -hmm. and produce. Yep. And it's just leading them to do things, again, that we haven't seen in the past. You said you wanted them to score. Well, when was the last time we saw them to have a victory knee? Um, I'm talking not this year. I mean, in years past, you know, for them to have a victory knee, for them to have a Hail Mary execution, for them to start, uh, you know, win football games by halftime, for them to yep. pull starters in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Everything we're seeing this year, we've never seen here. And we're sweeping the Giants who've owned us. Yeah. Uh, of course, and go up there and beat them and not play your A game and still be light years better than mm -hmm. them. It's a scary thought, man. It's a scary thought for sure. And great hard running from Chris Rodriguez Jr. But respectfully to C-Rod, I need him to come out that number 23 for Marshawn Lattimore, man. I need that number 23 to go to the money, man. That practice squad money ain't going to be as good as this, this money coming from Marshawn. Trust me. Hey, cut, <laughs> cut, 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 cut the check, Sean. As soon as you <laughs> touch down, as soon as you pass your physical and the, and the trade goes finalized, go to the equipment room, tell Chris Rodriguez Jr. I got you you my guy get that number 23 and let's keep it pushing austin eckler just under four yards to carry Jaden for 35 mcnichols for 20 we didn't play our a game still put 27 on the board still left multiple drives stranded that could have turned into something else Tressway barely plays football for this team, and <laughs> Washington's offense is still getting it done on a weekly basis. So let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. Dante Fowler Jr. looks like as good an edge rusher we've had since Ryan Kerrigan. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the Dante Fowler that I remember seeing back in Indianapolis at the Combine in 2015. Coming out of Florida, mm -hmm. down in Florida, you know, he had to, he had to, he was clean cut and had the flat top, mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely looks different now with the and the beard. But the, the thing that stayed constant is this guy is twitchy and he can come around that edge. And unfortunately for him, you know, he, he, it's, you know, he hasn't put it all together over the past few years, you know, but still has, has been effective. And, you know, and in Dallas last year, you started to see it, man. Like, this guy still has it, like, and at a high clip. He just needs to be given that opportunity, uh, uh, you know, a true starters-type opportunity where he can get the reps. Because, you know, Rio, those certain players that, you know, they get better as they get lathered up in the game. You yeah. know, they have to have a feel for what's going on and not be platooned all the time. Mm -hmm. And so for them to be able to let this guy turn loose, man, he looks good. And you're right, he looks like – the best edge rusher I've seen Washington have since Ryan Kerrigan. And, um, and he's doing it in a variety of ways. Ryan was more of a bull rush guy, kind of come up field on you mm -hmm. um, and brute you, you know, to get to the quarterback. Well, Dante's got techniques, man. You know, he, he's got a spin move. He's got a, a, a under, you know, hand grip, uh, rip. I mean, he's doing it all and he's creating turnovers on top of that. And that's what you want to see. And my favorite thing about Dante Fowler Jr. is he plays to the whistle. Some of these sacks are happening because he stays with the play. Yeah. We've seen guys come through here. I don't even got to say the names because people know exactly who I'm talking about who <laughs> don't play through the whistle. If they don't initially get to the quarterback, they whistle. start jogging and the play's over to them. Dante Fowler, even if someone else looks like they have the quarterback, he's still fighting to the very end. He's cleaning up plays where quarterbacks get loose. He has six and a half sacks through nine weeks. Six and a half sack, a forced fumble, a fumble recovery, and a pick six. That boy is balling. If Washington has proved anything defensively through nine weeks, it's that we can get to the quarterback. Getting Dorrance Armstrong back on the field 
is such a big deal because yes. he, even when he's not sacking the quarterback, he's making life hard for him. He's playing with discipline. He's not giving up contain on the outside and he has a pass rush plan that puts him in the vicinity of the quarterback on a regular basis. It just looks different when 92 is out there. Man, you can say this, you know, and I know it could ruffle some feathers, but what you're seeing from Dorrance Armstrong and Dante Fowler is what you were supposed to have seen from Montez and Chase. Agreed. And, and, and I mean, literally to a T, the way they play the game, Dante is Montez on steroids. I mean, let's call it like it is. Mm -hmm. He's 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 that uber pass rusher that's coming. Dante, I mean, um, um, Dorrance is more of a guy that can rush the passer as well, which mm -hmm. we've seen. But he is definitely a technique guy, you know, yeah. that will hold you up. Like you said, keep containment, um, you know, and he's strong enough. You know, he, he can make some moves on your lineman to get to your quarterback, too. And, and all you need to look at with both these guys and their production this year and their first year with Washington to go along, obviously, with Dan Quinn and Joe Witt is that's why that team in Texas is suffering so much on the defensive side of the ball with absolutely no pass rush. Our interior defensive line. That boy Johnny Newton gets after it, man. Man, listen, every t every time, <clears throat> you know, he makes a play, I, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not trying to blow smoke or pat myself on the back, but because exactly. I did tell you, mm -hmm. listen, I knew what I was seeing. I, you know, I'm a Big Ten guy, Penn State. You know, you see it up there somewhere. We are over there, over there, over there, over there. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I kept saying, this guy was a wrecking ball at Illinois. He just was disruptive. Undersized a little bit, yeah. But remember, I said he reminded me of Aaron Donald just with his foot movement. And you're seeing that. Even in early in the year when when before John Allen was injured, you saw Johnny Newton running down ball carriers yeah. or just hustling to the to the final whistle. Another thing that we just said Dante Fowler does. So does Johnny Newton. Well, now you're seeing him get comfortable. You know, he's he's comfortable. He's stuffing the run. Um, he's applying pressure. Uh, and, and he has that that energy about him that's contagious. And, and, and again, he's yet another player that plays with that nasty edge, soft-spoken mm -hmm. off the field, very soft-spoken off the field. But on the field, he's just an absolute maniac. I love yeah, it. He's a, he's a killer. He plays with that screw-loose energy that I need on this defense. He's relentless. He is so good. Watching him and Federian Mathis partner up with Deron Payne, it's like we're not missing a beat. You know, we would love to have Jonathan Allen out there, but – let the young boys cook. Our second round pick this year and our second round pick for a couple years before, they're getting after it. But Darian Mathis is good, right? He got a little banged up on Sundays. He all right? Yeah, he'll be good. He'll be good. You know, probably won't practice today. But, um, you know, it probably might be out there. You know, we'll, we'll find out in a couple hours. But um, I expect him to be give it a go against against the Bears. I mean, I'm sorry, against um, Pittsburgh. You know, the thing is, when guys get nicked up like this, and we just talked about it with Marshawn, when guys get nicked up and you're losing, mm -hmm. eh, the injury hurts a lot more. Yep. <laughs> but when you have a chance to be part of something special, you 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 don't want you don't want to miss time. You know, you want to give it a go. So I expect him to be out there. And besides, he's got to make up for dropping that uh dropping that would be interception for a touchdown. Oh my Take gosh, <laughs> Big Phil, you got to get your hands ready, big dog. I know they don't <laughs> want defensive tackles on the jug machines at practice, but man, that was right in your bread basket, man. But Jeremy Chin had 12 sackles on Sunday. <laughs> Ever since week two, he's been a man on a mission, a guy on a one-year prove-it deal. He seemed like he's bag chasing right now. Yeah, you know what he looks like. He looks like the Jeremy Chen that finished runner-up to Chase Young for rookie defensive rookie of the yep. year a couple of years. Probably should have won it. <laughs> yeah. He probably, probably should have won it, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the only difference was is that Washington won the division, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, you look at what he's doing right now. Um, he's even, even improving in pass coverage. I mean, everything is clicking for him. And, you know, it takes time sometimes to learn a new scheme, you know, learn a new, the intricacies of doing things a different way. And, you know, uh, you, you can tell that Joe Witt and Dan Quinn haven't even really opened up the full bag on their defense. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's so vast. But what they have implemented and, and stayed with guys are getting more comfortable in that. And I think for him, we all know that Jeremy Chen was a head basher, 
was the guy that would come up and put his hat on you. And he's definitely doing that, as you said, 12 tackles. But again, I, I am impressed with the pass coverage. He's, he's, he broke up a couple of balls on Sunday and that's a sign that the light bulbs come on in this scheme for this guy. And he's talented. So yeah, he's going to get his bag. I think all these guys that they brought in on these one year deals, the intent with the one years with two year options, uh, they're they're all going to get new contracts, you know, because they have the cap money to do it. So this thing is sustainable, and a guy like Jeremy Chen is going to be a long term plan uh, in their long term plans in Washington. Yep, him and Quan Martin, they have held it down on the back end of the defense. We actually, on a consistent basis, see safety help when wide receivers are running routes now. While they were finding their rhythm in the second half when we were playing more of a looser defense, yeah. Yeah. Washington held up for the most part. Bobby Wagner and Luvu, not their greatest game on Sunday, but not a terrible game at all. I wish guys like Chris Manhurts weren't scoring touchdowns on us in the first half of game. I wish we weren't breaking Daniel Jones' streak because coming into this game, the Giants had only scored once at home all season, and Daniel Jones' last touchdown pass at home was the 1st of January 2023, but – Washington let them get three on Sunday. I wish we would have tightened up a little bit, but I'm not going to over critique a victory because we did what we have to do to get out with the dub. Yeah. I mean, look, man, it's hard to get dubs in the NFL. It's mm -hmm. hard to win games in professional sports in general. And for Washington to, to, to win in a, in a place that hasn't been the best to them. I think, you know, a couple of years back, they did get a, a final victory uh, uh, of the season went up there. Um, I can't remember who to say. 2021 it was versus Jake Fromm. Uh, Jake Fromm. And they, I think uh, 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 the, the safety they brought in from Miami had to pick six. Um, oh, yeah, at the end of the game, yeah. Uh, but outside of that, man, literally, it's been a house of horrors, you know. Um, outside of Sunday, the last time I was up there, you know, it was just that dreadful, dreadful – uh, game where they just couldn't get any points. I remember Jahan drops a pass at the end of the game. Um, <laughs> you know, it was just they they never could get right in New York. And even in this game, they, as you said, they left a lot of meat on the bone, but they just were the dominant superior football team. Anyone could see that they were a better football team. And I just think that for a lot of the guys that no one said this, but I think a lot of guys, it was just to get up there, get the dub and get out of there unscathed. Um, with no injuries and, and just move on because they knew that the big one's coming Sunday. As odd as the defense looked at times, they kept neighbors under 60 yards. Uh, they kept Darius Slayton under 50. Wondell Robinson had 10 yards receiving. They're blanketing wide receiver rooms because uh, two weeks ago versus the Chicago Bears, the highest receiver output was 41 yards by Roma Dunze, 39 by Keenan Allen, 27 by DJ Moore. So while we sit and we nitpick and we highlight when Benjamin St. Juice gets a pass caught on him or Noah Igbenogany, we're not seeing too much Emmanuel Forbes, and they even tried to move him at the deadline. The cornerback room is not playing terribly. No, not at all. I mean, they've they've improved greatly each week. You know, you can see it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and I and I do. I think in the second half of the game, especially in the fourth quarter, they they pretty much went to a prevent defense, which I hate because you know prevent defenses prevent you from winning, uh, mm -hmm. prevent you from keeping your stat line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but they wanted to keep everything in front of them to make the Giants work the clock. That's all that was. Uh, but in the first half and even through the first, you know, three quarters, the defense was all over their receivers. They weren't able to get any kind of separation. There wasn't a lot of 10-yard coverage, you know, playing off. They were pressing. And now <laughs> – if you think the corner room was already playing well, you bring in Lattimore. <laughs> yes, sir. And yeah, man, this is this is about to get real, real around here. <laughs> I think my favorite thing is that Mikey can go back to the inside where they drafted him to be. He has fared decent on the outside. He's been getting a lot better on the outside. We don't have to force him into a new position now. No, and I, I do know that Mikey does want to play on the outside, too. Um, most guys do because they know that's where you can make plays. Um, but 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 his twitchiness, his tackling ability, his his ball hawking ability. 
I think it does suit him better where they drafted him to be, and that is underneath in the slot. And I just think from a size perspective, you know, I feel more comfortable with Mikey having to go up against a Devonta Smith and, you know, underneath, um, you know, at times, as opposed to being stuck on the outside against Devonta Smith or AJ Brown, it just works out better from a size standpoint and um, his IQ. I think, you know, you have to be a smart guy to play the smart, play the slot. And I think Mm -hmm. his football IQ is off the chart. So I think he's going to fare well and let's face it. He's going to get a lot of looks now in the slot because, People aren't going to be throwing to whatever side Lattimore is on. They're going to be coming at him and Benji still. So he's still going to get a chance to make some plays. Absolutely. And that's going to be your starting cornerback room. It's going to be St. Juice at the number two. It's going to be Marshawn, number one, and Mikey in the slot. What is the plan with Forbes? Are they just trying to minimize his snap counts and trying to make him a more efficient corner? Or is he just not a part of the game plan for real, for real? You know, that's a great question. I, I think from the outside looking in, it, it, it probably appears that they want to just limit how many opportunities he has to be put in a bad situation, you know. But I, but I think from being inside the locker room and seeing the interactions and things like that, I don't necessarily feel like they've totally given up on him. Mm-hmm. I just think that they're in a they're in a win mode situation, you know, so they can't put them out there and just develop them and go through all the heartaches and things like that um, because they don't need to. I mean, they have guys that are getting the job done and you're winning. Right. So it limits his opportunities. And I do think, you know, if, if they would have found a, a taker for him, um, they probably would have moved him. You know, some people were saying, well, wow, New Orleans didn't even want him as part of the package for Lattimore. I, I don't know if that's something that Adam Peters wants to do. I, I, I think they, they really want to exhaust all means with, with Emmanuel, you know, because this guy was a first round draft pick, albeit we didn't think he was a first round draft pick. The, the previous regime did. And it's, it's at times showing that he's a, he's a football player. He's a professional talent. Yes. But was he a first round draft pick? Probably not. No. And uh, so Washington's just trying to exhaust everything they can because the best thing that they could do for him is get him on the field for a couple plays and he makes some plays because that's take for them <laughs> if you try to move him in the offseason. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're going to release him. Um, they released Effie Abada, you know, yesterday. So to me, if there was the time to release Emmanuel Forbes, it would have been right after the trade. Um, you know, for Marshawn Lattimore, and they didn't yep. do that. So I, I still think he's 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 plays into what they're trying to do right now. Nickel coverage guy, give guys some some rest at times. Hell yeah. And I think if you're going to release a cornerback, I think Michael Davis should be the first one on that list to be released. But do you think at all, because I see some fans saying this, I don't feel this way at all. Do you think Washington – overpaid for Marshawn because the Ravens yeah. and the Chiefs were um there's they were swarming no not at all and, and you can't overpay for someone that's going to make you better <laughs> I mean <laughs> right I, I truly believe that uh it, it's 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 like you know your first date you 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 know you, you got a beautiful person you're taking out on a date um you know, you, you, you're trying to win them over, man. <laughs> you know, you try to make your life better. Um, that day's going to tell a lot. <laughs> so it's going to tell a whole lot. It's going to tell a whole lot. So for me, what they did was this is a, a ego boost for him, too, because he saw a team that is a playoff caliber football team that's ascending. That's now the, the media darling nationally because of, mm-hmm. because of Jaden come after you and come after you. Yeah, with maybe one or two more picks than another team would have done. But guess what? Washington needed him more, in my opinion, than those other teams. Uh, you know, and for me, I like in this trade when you you broke it down very eloquently earlier as far as the, the picks and what they were. So mm-hmm. Washington gave up their third rounder, but they still keep the third rounder they inherited in the John Dotson trade, which, by the way, was to Philadelphia from Miami. So mm-hmm. technically, Washington's keeping Miami's third rounder. Yeah. Miami 
thinks this year. So there's like twenty, there's like twenty picks in between. Yeah, absolutely. So kudos to Adam Peters for knowing which third to give up. So, um, and then you moved up from the sixth to the fifth in this trade um, as far as swapping picks. So basically, in my money, they gave up a fourth rounder for Marshawn Lattimore. That's it. Four time Pro Bowl. That's, That's it. What it was exactly. Mm-hmm. That's brilliant. And yet again, it goes to show why Adam Peters is playing chess where everyone else is still playing checkers. Washington has a GM GM because guys, I promise you, we did not overpay. First of all, the biggest hole on the roster is not having a true CB one, a true cornerback one, Mm -hmm. the Dotson trade, the Ridgeway trade and a fourth round pick. That's what got it done. And we got a fifth. They gave us a fifth round. <laughs> we pick. moved back up. Right. Yes. Like we hit, take our six. We're going to, we're going to get a fifth. So pretty much the only thing we gave without recourse is a fourth round pick for a starting caliber cornerback. I need you to put your NFL insider hat on for this one. How injured is Marcus Lattimore? Was that a business decision and a lack of inspiration in New Orleans? Is that hamstring going to miraculously get touched by the Midas touch as soon as he gets here? Hey, listen, man. (laughs) Listen, listen, guys. Uh, Rio, I'm telling all your viewers right now, everybody watching this, appreciate the love, by the way. There is no way in hell (laughs) Adam Peters and Dan Quinn are trading for Marshawn Lattimore for him not to be on the field. And Mm -hmm. if they thought that the hamstring injury was a real problem and that they would just get him next year, then you just do that in the offseason. I mean, you make a move for a corner in the offseason mm-hmm. or you draft a, a you know first round pick corner or whatever. They went out and got a guy that, yes, does play into their future as well. So mm-hmm. I, I can understand them seeing him a long term fix there at number one corner. I get that. But they know what they're up against this year. They understand the timing of this. You know, the before the trade deadline, and you got the Steelers and the Eagles coming up. The Steelers just went out and got Mike Williams to go alongside George Pickens. You got the Eagles coming up. We already talked about their wide receiving core. Um, CD Lamb, Cowboys, I mean, yeah, whatever. Um, but but you know, they still have the Falcons later on. And they're thinking playoffs. They're mm-hmm. thinking Amron St. Brown. They're thinking mm-hmm. All these teams that they're going to have to play potentially in the playoffs, Justin Jefferson, Minnesota, y- you have to have a corner. So yeah. I don't think they're, they made this pick thinking that this guy may not be on the field to help them in this run. Uh, I think I would be absolutely shocked if he is not on the field Sunday against Pittsburgh. Let's just say he doesn't play. I absolutely would put up my uh, my media hat and say he definitely will be playing and going up against A.J. Brown in Philadelphia because that's a Thursday night game. And that's the one I got circled because maybe if your hamstring is a little gimpy, maybe they don't throw him out there Sunday against George Pickens. I would love him to because George Pickens is a dog, and that's the problem. Yeah, because you're going to have two games within a four-day span. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Maybe it's just the Philly game he comes back to. Yeah, because – I think we keep forgetting that that's a Thursday night game. Guys, we play Philly in eight days. That is next <laughs> week. That's next week. We got to play all of Pit- we got to play all of Pennsylvania in a 4-day span. We got the Steelers coming to town Sunday afternoon. Game didn't get flexed. It's going to be a 1 o'clock kick. And then we got Philly the matchup, we probably going to be in the all whites. We're going up to Philadelphia on Thursday night football for the showdown of all showdowns. We've been hearing all season. I've been hearing the chirping from Eagles fans. They don't think we're for real yet. <laughs> I need Marshawn ass on that field next Thursday late. Listen, man, you, you know, everyone that jumps in <clears throat> into my timeline, into your timeline to talk junk about, this team's not good and you're biased media and I, you know, you, how can you do this? You see them every day and you're, you're hyping them up. I had a fan, literally you can go on our last, last show. Mm-hmm. He's on there telling me, Lake, I need you to stop hyping up Jaden, you know, keep, keep it, you know, lower your temperament because it's still early. No, no, I'm not. Doing <laughs> <Absolutely> no. <laughs> I'm telling you to raise your energy because this guy's that good. This team Special that good Mm -hmm. it's not just us locally it's nationally 
everyone seeing this. I'm not making this up. They're in everyone's top five power rating. Except for Adam Rank, of course. <laughs> <laughs> 29, really, bro? Um, so, no. They're in everyone's top five in the, as far as power ranking. So, they're a good football team. It's okay. You know, we don't – I don't want to keep saying this every week because wh what are you going to get to? What, the playoffs? What do you want to get to? The Super Bowl before you say, maybe they really could win the game. No, stop. They're making moves now to tell you, are we – and I tweeted this out yesterday, Rio. Are they as good as Detroit right now? Probably no. not. And I'm not saying that to hate. Probably not. But I tell you what, when you go out and you make a move to get a four-time Pro Bowler <laughs> – you're saying to Detroit, we're going to find out <laughs> where we we're, we're willing to put our chips on the table and see if we can come into Philly to see if we can go into Green Bay, Minnesota, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, you know, Detroit. We're willing to throw our chips on the table and say we want to line up our 22 against yours and let's see what happens. That's what they did yesterday. We're breaking the will of opponents. I think we broke the Chicago Bears because right the Bears, that, ha that Hail Mary hangover took them to Arizona and they got belt to ass by the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> Talk about the Arizona Cardinals, the number one in the NFC West five win Arizona Cardinals. I think people forgot Washington beat them by four touchdowns. Beat the breaks off of them in Arizona. And, and that's the thing. For everyone saying, oh, do you haven't played anybody? When they beat the Bears, the Bears were four and two. And we kept saying, who have the Bears played? <laughs> Their four wins were against teams that had a combined four wins at the time. Combined. So, again, Washington's, whoever's lining up in front of them, they're doing what they're supposed to do. The Tampa Bay loss does not look bad because that's a playoff caliber football team. I know they had the heartbreaking overtime loss, you know, against Kansas City on Monday. Respect to Baker, um, by the way. He's playing out of his mind. Absolutely. So that that was a legit loss week one on the road and that stifling heat. I don't want to remember it because it was yeah, I was yeah. there and it was unbearable. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they lost to Baltimore in Baltimore. And look at what Baltimore is doing to anybody that rolls up in the Baltimore. <laughs> They're murdering them. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't do that to Washington. Washington didn't play their best game, but still had a chance for 225 to get the ball back. They didn't, but had a chance to get the ball back and maybe tie that football game. That's their two losses. That's it. Everyone else, for all intensive purposes, outside of the Giants game week two, they've put to sleep. <laughs> And mm -hmm. and the games at you knew in your heart and in your mind they had it. This game's over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Washington got this. It doesn't matter what happens. And even in the Chicago game, where the Hell Mary did win the game for them, they were so much better than Chicago for 56, 57 minutes of that game. They were so much better. And and I think now you're seeing opposite directions Washington still going this way Chicago's going down Chicago looked dreadful against the Cardinals and again what they did to the Cardinals in Arizona what was that week 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 four after they mm -hmm. beat Cincinnati they went mm -hmm. there and by the way Cincinnati a game out of 500 there seemed like they're starting to figure some things out as well Washington's a good football team I, I can't keep selling this anymore <laughs> Point, point blank period and you're lying to yourself if you cannot admit that Washington is a good football team the NFC East race is down to two teams late it's us in Philadelphia Dallas their goose is cooked Dak Prescott will be out for several weeks and they're already sitting with five losses Washington is most likely going to be seeing Cooper Rush or Trey Lance on the 24th of November, making those two games versus Dallas. You don't want to look past divisional opponents, but based on what my eyes have saw this year, those are two games Washington should expect to win, right? Yeah, not just win, win comfortably. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, so that's two wins right there. And I said this, uh, <clears throat> said this on my pod the other day. All Washington has to do is split with Philadelphia. Here on out, if you look at their schedule, if you if you sweep Dallas and split with the Eagles, you win the division. There's that's just ten wins. That's it, ten. That's ten wins, and you have to understand why I say this because people are like, well, they still have other games. They have Tennessee. They're beating Tennessee. 
I mean, they have New Orleans with now with Marshawn and Lattimore. Um, you're beating New Orleans, you know. So now that's twelve wins. <laughs> it's a winning the division, you know. If you're if you're twelve and five, you're winning the division. Um, and then you still have, <clears throat> excuse me, you still have Atlanta, and that's, you know, Atlanta's not the same team away from Atlanta. You know, let's just be honest about it. They're a good football team, playoff mm-hmm. team. Kirk Cousins, Raheem Morris, they're doing their thing. But but Washington should win that football game at home at that time if they have taken care of the business late leading up to that. So in Rio, man, we could be looking at a 12-13. Oh, and I know man. what you want. I know all you want, the, you, realistically, is just get to that 11 mark so they yep. can – it's another record that they finally put to sleep too. Mm-hmm. You know, just black uniforms. They finally can put the 11-win mark. I think they're the only team in the NFL – it hasn't done that over the past 30 years. Yep. Only team. They're they're close, man. I mean, they're at seven now with what nine more to go? Eight, eight, eight more, eight more uh, to go. Eight, eight more to go. They're 500 football gets us there. 500 football, like four and four <laughs> gets us to 11. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I, you know, we feel it. I know it. I see it. And I've seen I've seen this since training camp every day. And I kept saying, man, like, am I really seeing what I think I'm seeing? Like, this is different. They just something different about the aura of this football team. And now the problem that I have that I struggle with is it's I know this is a good football team. I know it's a playoff caliber football team. But it's starting to it's starting to show me that this is kind of a championship type season here, man. And it's it's, whew, you know, you 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 get you the hairs on your arm raised up. I don't have any mm-hmm. on my hair, on my arm raised up because <laughs> I know what I'm seeing. You have to remember, I covered the Ravens the year they won the Super Bowl, and before I came to Washington, and I know what I was seeing. I know what I saw in training camp. The fireworks that were going off in practice the physicality brotherhood just the precision tuned look of that team damn if that's not this football team i'm what i'm witnessing right now i'm not saying that they're beating kansas city and they're beating detroit but what i'm saying is they're gonna be on the ass Mm -hmm. (laughs) and on top of that they're young so this is very much sustainable. So for everybody out there that says this year isn't it, next year there's no reason with the draft that they can have because we already seen Adam Peters and what he can do with drafts, mm-hmm. with the free agency, and with the fact that people are going to want to come here now. Yep. We've been saying that for weeks. This thing has the potential to shift a seismic shift in the NFC to be coming through D.C. for years to come. We still got seven picks, including a first, second, and third round pick in next year's draft. We're sitting on $120 million salary cap. Believe what your eyes are seeing, guys. This is a good football team, and we have the biggest boxes of the organization. Check. Ownership group. Check. Front office. Check. Coaching staff. Check. Franchise quarterback. Check. We got a six and two Pittsburgh Steelers team coming up to Northwest Stadium where Washington is four and oh on the season. We are two and a half point favorites versus Pittsburgh, <laughs> a team that never has a losing record. When the last time we were favored to beat the Steelers, Lake? <laughs> I, I mean, man, like, like that's it right there. That that's all you need to know. Vegas sees this. Mm-hmm. And, and for my money, Rio, they're only gonna be favor to lose one game the rest of the year and that's going to be thursday night next week they're not favored to be philly they'll probably have philly favored by two to three Mm -hmm. outside of that if you if (laughs) trust me when i tell you they're not going to be favored to lose another game and if they were to reel off these two wins against pittsburgh and then do it again against philly oh we man you're talking about now people starting to favor them to not lose another game um, <laughs> until they get maybe a championship game or something. And we can start talking crazy. We can start right. talking crazy. I want this one Sunday bad. I want it all. I want six it and all. two, six and two team coming into town. Mike Tomlin, love Mike Tomlin, one of the most respected coaches, never had a losing season during his tenure as head coach of the Steelers. 
That defense out of this world, they have an otherworldly defensive player in TJ Watt, a guy that can single-handedly take over a game. They have a great receiver in George Pickens. Najee Harris can run the football. We should win this game, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think Washington wins the game. I think we're better. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to say this, man, again, not blowing smoke. This is me if I was sitting in Alaska and I had to observe and, and, and break down both these teams. Washington, to me, is the better football team, and they're at home. They should win this game, and I think that they should cover their spread <laughs> for sure. Um, and then I ask this question because, you know, I'm a huge Mike Tomlin fan. No one has more respect for him than I do. And the unnecessary heat that he takes, I mean, shut the hell up. If you had that guy as your coach and every year you're relevant, <laughs> I mean, that's good. That's great. I, I think, though, I'm looking at who who has Pittsburgh really played. You know, you, you have to break that down as well. Mm -hmm. And they come in similar to Chicago. You oh, know, bye. yeah, winning record, off a of bye. Good football team, but how good are they? We're going to find out more about Pittsburgh playing Washington, probably so much than Washington playing against them. Yeah. Um, but I but I think Washington wins the football game. I think they win it as well. I think Russell Wilson, while his accuracy is still there, his arm strength and his mobility, they're a shell of what he formerly was in his career. I think we're going to make it a long day for him. And I think our offense is still – efficient enough to find ways to score and if we get in 24 to 27 range i'm not sure pittsburgh offense can score with us but that's gonna wrap up this week's victory tuesday wednesday whatever you want to call it our wrap up of the final game and our look forward to next week's game let let no let people know where they can find you on your way out I appreciate that, man. You know, made a big change. Uh, so on YouTube now where you can subscribe to my podcast, The Lake Lewis Jr. Show, you can subscribe there. But you also can subscribe to my channel. Um, it was Sports Journey. Now it is The Lake Lewis Jr. So make sure you go to uh, that page and subscribe um, that channel and subscribe. And then, of course, you can check me out on social media at Lake Lewis Jr. on all platforms. Uh, you can go to sportsjourney.com and see some work. And then, of course, you can see me uh, most post games, uh, you know, on ABC uh, in D.C. doing post game. Absolutely. Make sure y'all follow and sub up our guy, Lake Lewis Jr. Until next time, hail to the Washington Commanders. Let's get to eight and two for the first time since I don't know when. Fingers crossed. Let's get to it, baby.